All set. Okay. Welcome, folks. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Eric Kalachik. I'm the director of the Hurry Institute for Computing. And uh, we're really excited to welcome you to this next in our Did You Know You Could series. Uh, if you're new to us, uh, the Hurry Institute here, we're dedicated to leading integrated initiatives and in researching technology development. Uh, we target a broad set of disciplines at the nexus of the computational and data sciences. We of course strengths in a variety of areas ranging from cloud to security, privacy to AI and a whole host of domain interactions uh, with over 300 different uh, research affiliates in our network. Program for today is just a quick word or two from me, and then I'm going to turn it over to our host, uh, Munib Hasnain. Uh, he's going to introduce our speaker, Mark Howard. Mark's going to talk for maybe 20, 30 minutes. This is not your typical lecture sort of format. Uh, it's more meant to be in the spirit of a round bag lunch, uh, which we hope uh, soon any of you know to finally get back to uh, being able to do. Uh, but in, this, uh, in the meantime, we'll just try and work to uh, maintain the spirit of it. Uh, in the speaker series here, we have, uh, I presented uh, a couple of weeks ago, we have Mark presenting today, and then there are two more for this semester. Maxwell Palmer will be coming to talk on, did you know you could estimate the effect of car ownership on the elect uh, electoral um, participation? And Frank Gunther will talk about, uh, did you know you could use brain computer interfaces to restore speech? Uh, if you have any questions at any time today, just please feel free to drop them into the chat. All right, if you want to register for upcoming ones, uh, please do so through Eventbrite, right? You can find those links in the communications that we've been sending out about the series in general. And without further ado, let me just quickly introduce today's host. Uh, this series in general is uh, moderated by the uh, graduate student fellows of the Hurry Institute. I'm extremely grateful to them for uh, their enthusiasm uh, in bringing these topics and the speakers together. Uh, Munib is a PhD student of biomedical engineering at BU. He received a BS in mechanical engineering from the University of Houston. Uh, he's interested in taking a joint experimental and computational approach to understanding control signals involved in motor control. And as a graduate student in Dr. Michael Economo's lab, he currently focuses on understanding the separation between movement planning and execution signals in the motor cortex of mice that perform a directional licking task. So, Manib, I'm sure you can tell us more about that maybe later. Okay, all yours. Cool. Thanks, Eric. So, yeah, today it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome our featured speaker, Professor Mark Howard. Um, before we get started, just to remind everyone to follow our uh, the Hurry Institute's channels. There's a Twitter, which is right here, and we have a YouTube channel. Today's event is being recorded, and it'll be posted on that YouTube channel. So also, before we get started, um, I'd like to try to get to know the audience a bit better, see who's attending and what level of familiarity you have with the topic. So I'm just going to ask a few questions that people can answer in the Zoom chat or there will be a poll. So the first question is, um, what is your field of study? So if people are willing to participate, you can type in the Zoom chat. OK, so we have computer engineering, computer science, psychology, chemical engineering, medicine, computational neuroscience, cognitive science, robotics, cool, biostats, psychology. Okay, so wide spectrum of backgrounds here. Okay, so next we'll do a quick Zoom poll. Um, and that question will be, what degree of familiarity do you have with today's subject? So AI and neuroscience, take 30 seconds to a minute to answer this. Uh, 
All right, results are in. It looks like about a little more than half of the folks here have a little bit of knowledge about AI neuroscience and then kind of 10 to 15 percent for none relatively familiar or very familiar. All right, and then the last question, another Zoom chat question will be, what do you hope to gain from today's presentation? So again, type in the Zoom chat, what do you hope to gain from today's presentation? Bit more silence on this one. Maybe that just means we want to know everything. That's what I want to know, at least. Okay, so I'm familiar with TNNs and visual neuroscience. Curious about applications in other fields. Cool. And want to challenge my view that artificial general intelligence cannot be achieved without synthetic biology. It's an interesting one. Maybe we can get to that in the Q&A section. Cool. OK, so now we're, we'll uh, end this little icebreaker section, and we'll, I'll introduce our speaker, Professor Mark Howard. So Mark studied physics as an undergraduate at Rutgers University. He completed his PhD at Brian Dice, working on cognitive psychology and cognitive models of memory, then went on to do a postdoc here at BU with Michael Hasimo and Chantel Stern. After his postdoc, he took a faculty position at Syracuse University before moving to BU a little more than a decade ago. And Professor Howard has worked in the areas of cognitive psychology, computational neuroscience, and most recently, AI. Lastly, before we start the presentation, I'd just like to remind everyone that you can use the Zoom chat to ask questions. Um, and we'll explore questions in more detail in the Q&A portion after the talk. Cool. Cool. So thank you, uh, and um, uh, thanks for having me, and uh, thanks for the introduction, and um, uh, hopefully this will be fun. Um, I'm shooting for uh, something like uh, 15 minutes, so probably it'll be done in a half hour. All right. Did you know? Did you know? Did you know a bunch of things? I decided to lean into the did you know theme. Every slide is did you know something or other. Um, so did you know that time is really important? Um, it, time is uh, something that's really essential to our experience uh, as, uh, you know, aware, uh, uh, as aware people as we go through the world. Um, if something interesting happens, clap occurs, some unexpected event, it doesn't immediately uh, cease to exist uh, in our minds. It persists for some time. Um, we can remember it, and here, let's do it again. We remember it, and it's almost like it recedes further from our present uh, as time goes by. Um, so I was trained as a, a physicist a little bit, um, and I, I went out to try and um, understand the equations and the um, the equations and the mechanisms that enable us to experience the world, right? Um, and in doing so, uh, I've become convinced that it's essential to, to build a real theory to be really constrained by um, detailed uh, data uh, from psychology uh, and from neuroscience, uh, and then to take considerations from uh, theoretical, uh, theoretical considerations in AI, and that only if you have a convergence of those three things do you have a chance of working out uh, something that's more or less correct. Um, and so the, the hypothesis we've pursued uh, in psychology and neuroscience and now AI is that the way the brain solves that problem of remembering the recent past as the clap proceeded in the past is it's something like um, the brain uh, records uh, a, uh, a, a timeline, a record of what happened when. So if the, the real world is providing you, for instance, with the melody with different notes happening at different times in sequence, and we're at this moment T uh, looking back over the world, uh, the computational goal of the brain is to try and provide a record of what happened when uh, leading up to the present. Uh, and we'll formalize that um, quite a bit. Now, I'll, I'm gonna talk about this idea um, first in the context of psychology. 
uh, and then uh, in the context of neuroscience, uh, and then uh, finally we'll do a little bit of uh, brand spank and new AI, uh, and I'm gonna touch everything at a really high level. All right, so did you know, did you know that psychology can constrain theory? Did you know that? Uh, well, you will in a moment. Um, this guy on the left here is Gustav Fechner. Uh, Gustav Fechner was a 19th century physicist um, who was interested in a number of things. He was interested in metaphysics. He wrote, uh, you know, books about, uh, you know, what happens, uh, you know, before you are born and after you die and angels and devils. He also had a really uh, lengthy treatise on the proper way to cut sausage. Uh, he was an interesting character. Um, uh, he's remembered today, uh, not for those other contributions, uh, but for something known as the Fechner Law. Uh, and the Fechner Law is really easy to describe. The Fechner Law, uh, the Weber Fechner Law, is basically the observation that many psychological variables appear to be uh, as if uh, they take a logarithmic mapping uh, from things out in the physical world. Um, so, and, and this is really ubiquitous and, and, you know, we've known this for a really long time. For instance, the reason um, that uh, we measure the loudness of sounds on, uh, in decibels, right, is because our perception uh, is on a logarithmic scale. So each, uh, each multiplication uh, by a factor of 10 appears evenly spaced to us. Similarly, the reason why the notes on a, a piano keyboard um, are uh, the way they are uh, is because each octave sounds like the same distance to us. That's actually a doubling of frequency. So on a logarithmic scale, those seem even, right? And this is uh, something that's been known for a really long time. And Fechner, um, Fechner understood the Fechner law as a means to uh, create a coordinate transformation between the physical world out there, right? Uh, and our internal experience uh, in here, right? So the amplitude of uh, different stimuli. And the Fechner law is pretty general. Um, so we, as uh, good uh, working psychologists, uh, trying to be, you know, careful scientists, about a decade ago, um, we made the hypothesis that um, this timeline also obeys uh, the Fechner law, right? Uh, here, let me go back to the little picture I was showing. Um, I've, I've drawn this uh, here uh, to be I've drawn this uh, to be sort of compressed uh, on purpose, right? So I've made this distance bigger than this distance, bigger than this distance, bigger than this. There's a compression uh, on this timeline. Um, and we hypothesized a while ago for various reasons, and I can't, I don't really have time to uh, explain all the, all the reasons why, um, that this uh, timeline ought to be uh, compressed. Uh, and so then uh, we uh, established uh, we asked the question, if you had um, a logarithmically compressed timeline, just assume that the brain had that, and then uh, you, the, the people were accessing that timeline in order to make judgments in various memory tasks, could you describe behavior in those tasks? Um, and so what I'm going to show you here is just a series of, um, a series of pictures from a variety of experiments, uh, psychological experiments, mostly with people, but there's also some rodent work in here. Um, showing data in some experiment on the left and model predictions if you assumed you had that, uh, uh, if you assumed you had that kind of representation in a reasonable cognitive model. And I'm just going to do this sort of tachystoscopically. Uh, this is Eintman Trask 63. Uh, this is a judgment of recency experiment by Doug Hintzman from 2010. Uh, this is, uh, oh, uh, this is a rat conditioning study in which there's four different conditions. Um, this is um, some free recall data actually from an episodic memory task you can do with people. Um, I actually collected some of these data uh, and there's model and data. Um, oh, and this is a really nice one. I'll, I'll take a moment and uh, pause on this one because it gives you some flavor for why this works. Um, this is uh, actually model is on the bottom and the data is on the top. This is from a judgment of recency task uh, in which uh, you get a series of um, stimuli really quickly. And then you have to say, then you get a pair of stimuli and you have to say which one happened more recently in the list. Um, and the behavioral results look exactly as if the way you uh, approach this uh, task is that you have some memory for the past. You take the two probes and you compare the probes sequentially to different parts of the past timeline and you stop when you find a match. And we've known about that for a really long time. Um, what well, you see on the right, actually you can sort of appreciate, um, I think you can appreciate this uh, result. 
Um, the response time, the amount of time it takes you to find a probe um, goes up like log of its time in the past, right? Uh, so it's as if you take your probes, you compare them to memory, you step along sequentially. However, the steps get bigger and bigger and bigger, one, two, four, eight, uh, 1632, um, as if there's a logarithmic scale for time. And the, if you assume that there is a logarithmic scale for the recent past, uh, you can make really great sense of these data. Uh, if you don't, uh, you have a really big problem. And so we've been convinced for quite some time just from looking at psychological results and careful, um, careful behavioral modeling, uh, careful cognitive modeling that the brain ought to have, ought to have access to that type of representation. Okay. So, um, happily, uh, around the time, uh, and so then we took really seriously, well, so the brain ought to have this, it feels kind of like, you know, there's a log timeline, we, we uh, you know, have access to this internal experience, perhaps the brain, um, uh, perhaps the brain does have uh, something literally like a logarithmically compressed timeline. Uh, of the recent past. Um, and fortuitously, around the same time we, we, uh, we were doing our cognitive modeling, um, the following observation uh, uh, was made actually here at Boston University uh, and also uh, at NYU, um, that there are these uh, uh, populations of cells in um, the mammalian brain. Uh, we've now seen these in mice, rats, monkeys, and I just saw on my desktop a as yet unpublished paper in humans that looks really nice. Um, uh, that, that suggests that uh, uh, brains, populations of neurons in the brain hold a record of the recent past. And so what I'm showing you on the left is an example of this phenomenon. Uh, you do an experiment and something interesting happens as kind of like the clap. Um, and then we're recording from different neurons uh, in the period of time in each trial after uh, the clap happens. I do I clap like a million times. Uh, and the top row is one neuron. It, firing as a function of time, and there's another neuron and a, 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 another neuron as well. And you can see that these fire sequentially um, as if uh, what they're doing uh, is as if each neuron in the population is responsible for a piece of the timeline. And when some objective past clap recedes uh, to the part of the timeline they're responsible for, they start firing, right? And they thus fire sequentially. Um, in the middle panel, um, you'll see that um, uh, you see 172 simultaneously recorded neurons. This is also recorded here at Boston University uh, by Will Mao uh, in Howard Eckenbaum's lab. Um, and you can see that there's this characteristic curvature uh, to, the, um, to the firing. Um, the panel C, uh, I'm, uh, I, I put in just to give you a sense of the variety of this. Notice that this sequence goes out to 60 seconds. Uh, this is a completely different brain region. This is medial prefrontal cortex. Um, and it's to remind me to tell you that um, at this point now, there's like several dozen papers on this phenomenon, um, and they basically cover much of the brain, right? It's hippocampus and prefrontal cortex, medial prefrontal cortex, lateral prefrontal cortex, uh, medial entorhinal cortex, striatum, um, and those are the places where people have looked so far. Um, they seem to be all over the place. I would add one other thing, the, um, uh, uh, although I'm not showing it here, uh, different stimuli trigger different sequences, right? Uh, so if I clap, that would cause one set of uh, 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 one set of cells. If some other stimulus happens, like you know a flash of light or um, a chirp or something like that, uh, you'd get some uh, uh, you get some distinct uh, set of uh, cells. So you can decode uh, from looking at the neurons right now. You can decode what happened when uh, in the past. Um, and the point I want to make here is that um, this curvature uh, that you see uh, in this dashed red line appears to be exactly logarithmic, right? If the cells were evenly spaced, if they were tiling the timeline evenly, you'd expect each part of the timeline to have the same number of cells responsible for it. You'd see a straight line uh, when you plot it uh, like in B here. And that's not the case ever, right? Um, and uh, we have a recent paper, uh, this is uh, on BioArchive, uh, from uh, Ray Tao and uh, uh, Jay Bladen, uh, data was collected here at BU, uh, Ray's doing the analyses, um, where they very carefully considered the, um, the precise form of that curve, uh, and we've become reasonably convinced that it's logarithmically compressed. And the easiest way I can convince you of this is to show a plot like in B or C, 
but just plot it as a function of log time. All right, so this is a, a logarithmic axis here. Uh, each marker here is uh, uh, four times uh, greater than the previous one. To the extent you accept there's a straight line of even width, right, as a function of log time, uh, you are convinced of the argument that um, the, this population of neurons has laid out its experience uh, as a function of, of logarithmic time, uh, like, uh, like Fechner, uh, only for time rather than uh, frequency or any of the other variables we might be measuring in the world. All right, hooray. Did you know that? Well, you know that now. Okay, so, um, and I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm hitting the highlights of like a large body of work here. Um, so we've, uh, did you know, did you know that distributed, uh, that deep neural networks with log compressed time, uh, log compressed memory are awesome? Well, you're about to know that. Um, did you know? Uh, so let's do a thought experiment. Um, uh, we've, okay, so we've given some uh, consideration as to why the brain would choose to do this for time, right? Uh, time is, uh, you know, integral in our experience. Uh, you can't begin to understand a word, right? Uh, uh, because a word is extended uh, over time, uh, you can't begin to understand what word I'm saying unless you can remember the beginning of the word by the time I get to the end of the word, right? Um, thinking of motor planning, uh, as uh, we were uh, chatting about uh, before we began, um, you can't uh, successfully... Uh, you know, type a word, uh, you can't successfully type a sentence uh, unless uh, you have a, a good plan of what the whole idea you're trying to produce is, right? Uh, almost every behavior you can think of is extended over time. So we've been thinking about why the brain uh, seems to have committed to this particular form uh, of logarithmic compression. Uh, and here's, uh, here's sort of the idea. Um, here, let's do a little uh, a toy thought experiment. Let's say, um, I'm gonna say a word and you can type, you don't need to put it in the chat, it's like really easy. Um, uh, I will just illustrate that we can do this. So if I say um, four, you know what digit that was, ha ah, four, you, you can type four. Uh, if I say eight, you can do that really easily. Nine, 10, so, um, okay, now watch this. Seven. Did you get that one? What, 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 what number was that? Okay. Um, and, and, and almost everybody can do this, right? Uh, and that was the number seven. Right? Um, and hooray. That seems like a really trivial task to know that that word was a seven. But it turns out that contemporary deep networks, um, they're used in speech recognition, can't do that task. They can't generalize. If you train them on things that are, that are at one speed, they can't spontaneously generalize to other speeds. And it turns out that if you construct your temporal memory uh, such that uh, it's logarithmically compressed, this is a unique solution uh, to being able to do that. Let me sort of explain what that is. Uh, so on the left here, uh, I'm showing you uh, time cells in A and B uh, plotted as a function of uh, hippocampal time cells plotted as a function of time on the top and as a function of log time uh, in the past. And I just sort of showed you that. And here's uh, sort of an intuition uh, as to why that would be helpful in solving, uh, uh, in, in, for instance, recognizing uh, things that are presented uh, really slowly. Uh, in C and D, I've shown you a time dilated signal. Um, the blue uh, might be the word seven spoken at a rapid rate, and the red signal might be me saying seven over like four seconds or whatever it was. Um, and so if you plot those signals on uh, those time dilated signals on a log axis, you see that they're just translations of one another down in D, right? Uh, red signal is just the blue signal slid over to the right. Okay, um, and this is just a property of logarithms uh, that you know you learned in eighth grade. Uh, log of ax, uh, log of a scaled uh, variable, is just log of that variable itself plus some constant. Every that is to say, everything slid over to the right. So, um, some colleagues of mine, uh, Brendan Jacks, uh, is first author on this paper, uh, and um, uh, I should mention Per Cederberg at University of Virginia and Zoran Tiganj. Uh, at Indiana University in computer science, uh, and uh, Akash Sarkar uh, here at BU has worked on this paper as well. Um, we use this idea about uh, log compressed time uh, to try and construct a, um, a deep neural network. 
uh, that would be able to generalize to different speech signals uh, at different scales. And so we trained this network and then a, a widely used uh, a deep network uh, on the task I just gave you. It's called auditory MNIST. You present a sequence of, uh, you present a sound and uh, the computer has to say uh, what, uh, the network has to say which uh, category it was. We presented them at scale one uh, and then we generalize to faster and slower scales. Um, and uh, we used a deep uh, scan in case uh, we're interested in that. And I'm happy to go into the weeds uh, if we want to talk more about that. Um, and basically, what you need to know uh, CNNs from computer vision have been you know, very popular in computer vision. They, they are built in such a way that they uh, are invariant to where you find the features in an image. So it doesn't matter if there's a octopus over here or over here or over here, it still notices that that's an octopus uh, and returns uh, where its location is for these conjunctions of features. And so because rescaling time just translates a pattern, okay, uh, on uh, this log time axis, like here in D, um, then we should be able to exploit that trick to generalize uh, time. And lo and behold, uh, it works. Uh, orange line here is uh, deep uh, CNN trained on auditory MNIST using uh, something called the temporal convolution network, uh, which does not have uh, log time. Uh, the, the, the time axis is evenly spaced, uh, and it can learn auditory MNIST very, very well at scale one, uh, 10 to the zero is one. Uh, they both networks do really, really good. Uh, on the things they were trained on. Uh, however, as you re as you change make things faster or slower, uh, the, the SIF network, uh, they call it SIF for various reasons, uh, generalizes over a really broad range of scales, right? Um, it doesn't need to be shown those stimuli because it's basically already experienced them. So uh, to summarize um, this log time assumption that from psychology seems like the right thing to do, uh, and appears to be going on in the brain, endows this deep CNN uh, with this novel, uh, novel for deep networks, uh, human-like property that uh, it can generalize to unseen stimuli that are faster or slower. All right, that was all I really wanted to say. Well, now you know, right? Uh, psychology, so as a meta point, psychology is essential to a theory of the brain. That is the one thing I feel most strongly about looking back on my whole career. Um, with respect to the problems we talked about today, time is central to our experience and to the brain as a computational device. Summary of the neuroscience work. We have a reasonably clear picture about how the brain in many different brain regions and many different species represents the past as a function of time. Um, and we've started uh, building uh, deep networks uh, to implement uh, these ideas and they seem to have novel properties. Uh, and I think, uh, 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 answering the question about AGI uh, in the chat, I think this can be this can be really, 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 really elaborated. Um, there's lots of other things about cognitive psychology I haven't told you about uh, that fit really nicely into this framework as well. Did you know? Did you know you could read more here uh, at uh, uh, this is uh, my lab website with lots of papers? Did you know there's PyTorch code for this deep network? Did you know that? Well, now you do. Uh, and here's a bunch of people who did stuff. Um, especially, uh, oh no, I, sorry, I messed this up. Oh, oh, Ray's bold. That's why I couldn't see her. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ray, uh, and, uh, Jay Bladen, uh, uh, did the paper I showed you about, um, and, uh, Per Cederberg and Zoran Tiganj are doing the most just of the work on the, um, deep networks. So that's all I wanted to say. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mark. That was Really fascinating. Okay, so now we have about 20 minutes for Q&A. So like I said before, you can type your question in the chat and I can ask them for you. Or if you want, you can raise your hand with the Zoom feature and I can call on you to ask questions. Also feel free to turn your mics on if you're comfortable or turn your video on if you're comfortable with that. And maybe I can start with the with the question while people are um, getting their thoughts together. So, um, in trying to study neuroscience with deep neural networks, I think the biggest criticism, or one of the bigger criticisms I 
hear a lot is like, well, the brain doesn't do backprop or, you know, the forward and backward passes of uh, backprop don't really make sense in terms of how the brain does learning. So like what, I guess, how do you address that criticism? I think that's a fine criticism. Um, part of, you know, what we're doing as theoretical neuroscientists is we ought to be replacing backpropagation um, with uh, other learning rules uh, and ones that take into account um, what ones that are ba that can be solved with time and space local uh, information. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's just this incredible infrastructure now uh, from you know these these major software packages. You type PyTorch, you go like and then go and like this magic happens. Um, I think you know what we're trying to do really in in dabbling in AI is we're trying to create. Um, sort of an incentive for people to take these ideas on board more seriously in neuroscience, right? If, 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 you know, log time is so useful to the brain and it's so ubiquitous in the brain, and it's also useful for deep networks, um, then uh, it's worth thinking uh, th that creates an incentive for people to think about this more seriously. Um, we're basically just trying to, um, <laughs> Uh, piggyback on the um, on the infrastructure that's already been worked out because it's it's really astounding, right? If you were to build an algorithm from scratch, you couldn't get a network that does anything useful. Uh, the, the amount of effort you'd have to do to build a network that does anything useful is like a hundred times greater than if you just can use PyTorch um, or your other favorite uh, backpropagation algorithm. And presumably, the endpoint is similar to what you would have learned from the true algorithm, whatever that might be. Cool. Okay. Um, I think we can go to Jenna next. Yeah, um, I'm working in the um, brain imaging lab, looking at brain age. <clears throat> and I was wondering if there's anything from what you've looked at for logarithmic time that relates to how the brain ages and whether we have any loss of that logarithmic time over our lifetimes or other. Yeah. So um, I actually, um, when I was at Syracuse, I did uh, in earlier, uh, at Brandeis as well. I, I worked at, with Art Wingfield at uh, Brandeis and then um, there was a pretty big cognitive aging group at Syracuse. So I put a lot of thought into this. Um, in our hands, at least, uh, in the memory experiments that uh, we were doing, it seemed that um, older adults seem to be preferentially bad, not so much at maintaining uh, an estimate of the past as logarithmic time, but recovering a previous one. So in episodic memory, um, you know, we've argued for quite some time that episodic memory is what happens when you jump back in time and recover a previous experience. And it's sort of like what Tolving, uh, sort of how Tolving defined it in the first place. Hey, remember when this talk started, you know, what, what were you doing? And um, the timeline for now is sort of augmented by a snapshot of a recovered um, timeline that was available at some previous point in the past, or uh, remember, remember last week when, uh, you know, this thing happened. Um, we, we believe that, um, we believe that that's accompanied by a jump back in time. So older adults seem to be, uh, particularly bad at whatever computational mechanism causes that to happen. Uh, and we saw that, um, uh, in episodic recognition studies, uh, and free recall studies, and we did a series of them. So yeah, brain aging, so the, the mechanism whereby we manage somehow to jump back in time and remember uh, a past event, uh, you know, we have some thoughts on that, but that's still very much open. Um, it would be really cool to um, map that onto uh, what's known about uh, neurobiological changes in aging, especially in the hippocampus. I know like Carol Barnes has done like incredible work on that, uh, going back a ways uh, and uh, also more recently as well. All right. Yeah, Eric. thank you. That was that was very interesting. Cool. Uh, and um, as, as I, I, one of the things I feel bad about it is talk, and also uh, I, I didn't put in as many references as I, as I might have liked. So feel very free to follow up, and I'd be glad to send you papers um, about any of this stuff. Cool. Thank you, Eric. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah. Quick question. Thanks, Mark. That was uh, I didn't know much of that, so uh, that was great. 
Um, can you tell me with the last plot, which was, I thought, very intriguing, the way you had the accuracy across many rescalings, is your methodology robust to um, uh, non-stationary scaling in the sense that we're, was, was the proof of concept there for, uh, for any given rescaling of, the, uh, of time, the methodology, the, the net is able to do a good job, or is it uh, then in fact, if I speak more stretched out and then compress and then more stretched out that it can also uh, adapt to that? Yeah, it ought to be able to. The question is, um, so like in every other deep network in the world, each layer sort of gets some guesses to uh, what it's examining and then sends it along. Um, in this case, it's uh, by analogy to a, a, you know, a, a visual CNN, which tells you what is out there and where it is, right? Is it over here, or over there, or over there? Um, this network is sending along what? Was that a phoneme? Uh, which phoneme was that? Uh, and then how fast was it? Fast, uh, fast or slow, the scaling A serves the role of uh, position. Uh, so yeah, it ought to. Uh, we haven't tested that out. Um, to come back to your other question about non. So yeah, the, as long as the as long as the functional units, whatever that means, um, sort of share a scale, right? So if you said one word fast and then slow, that should be fine. Um, if you had a word. Uh, and you spoke different parts of it fast and slow within the same word and the different phonemes, depending on how the, as long as the functional units within each level are intact, maybe, you know, a phoneme level, it should be okay. And it should generalize just fine. Um, I would say actually, in order to um, make this a, a broader talk, uh, I would also say that the brain is really, really good at responding to non-stationary statistics more generally, right? Um, and so uh, one of the cool things about having a log uh, compressed timeline is that there's not a natural scale to its end, right? And so you can have many things at different time scales predicting what's gonna happen in the next moment. Um, so there's, there's some very natural, uh, there's some very natural uh, sort of cognitive models of non-stationary statistics that you can write down, at least on the psychology side, uh, whether those generalize to um, uh, the deep networks, we haven't done that yet. And uh, one of the reasons I keep putting the GitHub everywhere and every talk is, is like, um, if, if, um, if I'm like 5% right about how useful this is, uh, there's lots of stuff and there's lots and lots of room for lots and lots of people to uh, work on things. There's, there's more problems than um, we can possibly address, and uh, I would like would like it very much if other people start making use of this. Stop share. Hold on. Yeah, uh, I got a a request. Mark, do you think you could maybe put that GitHub link in the Zoom chat? Yes, possibly. Figure out how to do the chat. If but yes, not, I can in, find it too. In principle, yes. And again, reminder, if you have questions, raise your hand or place them in the chat. Did you know? Let's see if this just works. Oops. Cool, I see it, thank you. I guess if no one else has questions, I can try to pick your brain about what we were talking about earlier, um, about motor planning. So you said that you found that there's multiple timescales of motor planning in mouse motor cortex, is that right? Yeah, yeah. What, what does that sort of look like? Because I've, I've seen some other studies that show that, um, if you sort of randomize this like delay period where you're asking the mouse to hold this decision, right? Um, if you randomize that time, um, then the mouse kind of just prepares instantly. So there isn't sort of like this ramping activity, it's kind of an instantaneous ramp. So I was wondering um, if you found those distinct time scales in a sort of a uniform 
delay period and also um, oh, um uniform in a in this experiment there was a constant delay period that could be appropriately timed uh, right. and that might be important um, yeah okay so, more generally like we can play the same trick um so in the hippocampus um there are time cells there are also place cells right uh, there's also, um, you know, uh, uh, cognitive map cells that, uh, you know, carry evidence about the, the carry uh, cumulative evidence uh, for how uh, certain an animal is of its upcoming decision, let's say. Um, it seems that um, those other variables are also logarithmically compressed. Right? We haven't, sorry, we haven't uh, said that it's precisely logarithmic function, but they look about the same, right? If I, I could make you a plot of uh, place cells, and if I showed it like that way relative to some landmark, um, you would see the same type of curvature and you would go, ha ha. Uh, in approaching a landmark, a goal, uh, as it were, you see sort of a reverse curvature. Right? Um, evidence, uh, imagine uh, you have an animal, uh, this is a paper by uh, Nia et al. I was in Nature last summer, uh, so maybe the summer before, I'm losing track of time. Um, in which uh, the animal had to keep track of how many towers it passed in some virtual hallway. Um, and the, the, there were cells that had receptive fields that piled the evidence axis, right? And they also showed this kind of curvature uh, as well. So I think um, what I'd really like to get uh, to thinking about um, is a, a more general framework in which quantities in the brain, how long is it until I have to make this movement, okay? Um, how long is it until I have to be prepared to execute this movement, let's say? Um, how far am I from my home cage when I started this journey on the track? Um, how close am I to being certain about what decision I wanna make in this environment with many changing things? Uh, that all of those quantities are sort of represented uh, with the same population level neural language uh, for coding for distances. And that time since now is one of uh, many other uh, such variables. So that's sort of the direction. So yeah, the, the result you said uh, makes sense if what that population is coding for is how long do I have to wait until I have to be ready to go right now, right? Uh, if it's a variable uh, four period, uh, he might have to go right this moment uh, and or he might have to wait. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So the, what you just said was pretty interesting. So the, the sort of hypothesis you're maybe trying to test is that there's this population level doctrine that each population sort of times its it's um, times its response to some function in the same way, but I guess like, how do you take into account the like functional differences between brain regions or cell type oh, yeah, differences yeah. between brain, brain regions? Lots and lots and lots of work to do. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay. Um, I would say that it's sort of analogous to, um, uh, so I had a lot of conversations with um, this guy, Randy Gallistel, uh, who's a you know, great, great psychologist. Um, and, you know, I was telling him about time cells and place cells and all this, and uh, he kept pushing on me that the, the most important thing to figure out uh, in the brain is what is a number, right? Um, and that really what you need is a computational language for doing arbitrary, compu for doing computations on arbitrary data, right? Um, so if you had that, you could write down like a control theory, right? Uh, so regular old control theories, you know, have some target uh, and here's where I am, and there's a plant, uh, and there's quantities describing where you want to go to and where they came from. And so you go, like, you might say, I want to go from here to there, right? Um, but that has to work no matter what is where, <laughs> no matter what two things uh, that, uh, you wanna, um, that you want to compute with. And so the real trick is building out uh, a number system, right? Um, and so that's sort of... Uh, I think that's the, the thing to figure out. And as it turns out, um, although we didn't really talk about it in this talk today, it goes a little into the weeds. 
uh, we're pretty sure that the sequences are accompanied by this other population um, that goes like E minus ST, right? That's coding for time sense something uh, with a variety of time constants. It turns out that's Laplace transform. That's real Laplace transform of these quantities. And so the, the question is, could you compute? If you could figure out how to do addition and subtraction um, and other you know, basic operations on Laplace domain quantities, um, then you could just write down answers to uh, questions. Some of Marcelo Matar showed up. Uh, where did he go? Oh, he went away. All right, that's okay. Um, you could write down questions like deciding um, you know, the value of uh, retrieved memory or something like that. Um, you could write down things like spatial navigation as just sort of uh, population level uh, equations. But yeah, population level doctrine is exactly where I'm going. Yes. Cool. All right, Matthew, then answer, ask your question. Hey, yeah, th um, thanks for talking about your stuff. I thought it was really interesting. Um, this is kind of a, just a general question um, coming from someone that's like not really, um, doesn't really have a background in neuroscience or like artificial intelligence. I was just curious if anyone has tried to um, build neural networks to model anything um, around like um, first principles. So, or like reaction kinetics um, happening like that actual neurons might, you know, um, have it's like physical properties. And if they've maybe done anything with that or. Um, if the question is, know. Has anyone done X with neural networks? The answer is almost always certainly yes. And it's largely <laughs> independent of what X is. Um, and I'm not, I'm not particularly the best person to ask about those things. I, I know a very small sampling of things that have been done in AI centered around, uh, centered, centered around things we think we can uh, use our, our hammer on. <laughs> things that look a little bit like a nail we might strike with our uh, our, our hammers. Um, so probably, I know there's lots of people who've done uh, neural networks. I saw a really cool talk by um, Tess Schmidt, uh, who's a professor of physics at MIT. Um, and she's building, um, uh, she's building um, uh, neural networks that uh, obey symmetry relationships in order to uh, use, uh, in order to build out faster, uh, uh, faster networks for understanding um, uh, like protein structure in the context of computational chemistry that might be a starting point to uh, get to uh, reaction kinetics or something. But yeah, somebody's probably done it. Uh, I'm, I, I can't necessarily, me, me not knowing uh, is not evidence of absence. The interface with physics and chemistry has, has heated up quite a bit in the last five years. Yeah, I'm, I I also am not an expert in the area, so I don't know if it's specifically where that meets uh, neuroscience at the neuronal level, but definitely uh, you know blending physical models, working at various scales of physical space from atomic upward, um, that's that's a very heated area. I think you can find a, a good bit now these days. Okay. Still growing though. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. It's certainly worth looking. <laughs> yeah. Right. We have maybe a couple more minutes for questions. If anyone has any, sounds like people don't have questions, and I'm I'm also out of questions. Um, so maybe we can wrap up here with some closing remarks. Sounds good. Let's see. All right, yeah, so I just want to remind everyone that the video today will be, from today, will be posted on the Hurry Institute's YouTube channel. Check that out. Um, and then on behalf of all the graduate student fellows who I think there's some of us scattered throughout here, um, thank you for attending. And lastly, there's another Did You Know You Could on Thursday, March 3rd, 
It, the topic is, did you know you could estimate the effect of car ownership on electoral participation? Sounds very interesting. Um, so that event's going to be from 1 to 2 p.m. on Zoom, register via Eventbrite if you're interested in attending. The speaker will be Maxwell Palmer from the Political Science Department. Cool. Thanks, everyone, for coming.